And Hillary, I think you can take it away. That's great. Now, Jen, I'm going to ask you one dumb question here. Yeah. Um, nope, I'm not going to ask that question. Okay. A sec. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and everyone else. Um, you, um, we would ask everyone do so as well. Oh, good. Hi, Cedric. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm Hillary Lambert. Um, steward slash executive director of the Cuga Lake Watershed Network. And um, through thick and thin, uh, we're really, really glad to have you with us here today for our fall community conference. We, we hold two a year, the Cuga Lake Watershed Network does, uh, one at the south end of the lake, uh, sorry, north end of the lake in the spring that we had to skip this year, and uh, one at the south end of the lake, uh, usually Ithaca-ish, uh, in the fall. And we've learned enough over the summer uh, how to communicate this way that we thought we'd give it a try to have a several session fall community conference. So this is the first one. Uh, we're going to feature uh, harmful algal bloom speakers today. And uh, near the end, uh, Jen, um, We'll show you a uh, flyer about our next presentation, which will be uh, November 4th, the day after a certain election. Um, and the topic will be hydrilla on Cayuga Lake. And we'll be sending out information about that over the next uh, couple of weeks. So you'll, you'll be hearing from us about it. You won't miss the opportunity. And then we'll hold a third one um, in early, uh, uh, the, net, the following week pertaining to our fabulous new strategic plan and our annual meeting. So that's our offering to you this fall uh, via the fabulous um, virtual world that we now inhabit. And um, uh, looking at the roster of people who signed up to attend today, it's really great because we usually have um, people um, from the North End for the North End Conference and people from the South End for the South End Conference and the folks in between don't tend to travel. And this time we got everybody from around the lake and um, <laughs> people checking in from far away too. So this is um, wonderful. And we hope the technology uh, holds steady as we continue and that our dogs won't bark too loudly. And at this point, um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Nathaniel Lawner, Nate Lawner. Nate has been um, with us to our great good fortune uh, for the last, uh, what is it, two years um, working um, with many, many hats via the Community Science Institute, which is a fantastic community organization in Ithaca uh, with a certified water lab. And Nate's two main hats there are as outreach coordinator for all the folks who do water quality sampling uh, around the creeks, like I'm in the Millican Creek group, and he got us to do a sampling last week. And um, that, that means dealing with hundreds of people and hundreds of samples and negotiating an awful lot of things. And then, um, and then um, he also has took over from Claire Weston, the new Harmful Algal Blooms Monitoring Initiative that Claire and Steve Penningroth, uh, executive director of CSI, and their lab staff developed, and um, has got, an, and a lot of the Habs Harriers, his trained volunteers are on the call today, because this is Nate's um, first opportunity to share with everybody the results of harmful algal bloom monitoring on Cayuga Lake um, this season. So, Nate, share your screen, take it away. Hold on. I just and, and quick, that's right, Jen. One quick thing is we are also, we're gonna let Nate uh, conduct his presentation in its entirety. And if you have questions along the way, please put those into that chat feature, which is down at the bottom of your screen. I'm going to capture all of those questions, present them to Nate at the completion of his talk. And 
Um, that's how we're going to manage questions during this session. And then at the very end, after both presentations are done, we're going to, going to allow an opportunity for additional questions at that time. So if you have questions while Nate is speaking, please just throw those right into the chat and I will keep track. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jen. And thank you, Hillary. Can everyone see my screen? All right. Great. Yep. Well, I want to I thank the Kugelite Watershed Network for hosting this community conference. And I'd also like to thank all of you who are joining us this morning to learn about the health of Cayuga Lake and about harmful algal blooms. Before I go any further, I also want to extend a special thank you to all of our Habs Harrier volunteers around the lake. These are caring people who take time out of their busy days to monitor the lake and transport bloom samples all around the watershed. Uh, to help us understand this water quality threat. Um, and our program really wouldn't be possible without them. So thank you. And finally, I want to extend a special thank you to our Habs Harrier Quadrant leaders. These are volunteer leaders around the watershed who really help keep this program running throughout the summer months, respond to uh, public concern, uh, help transport bloom samples at all hours of the day, um, and really help keep this program running. So thank you very much. We really, really appreciate your work uh, this summer and in past summers. So today I'll be discussing the work that we've done over the past three years to monitor harmful algal blooms on Cayuga Lake and what we've learned through the data that we've collected. So before I go into the results from 2020, I want to quickly review what harmful algal blooms are. Now I know we have many Habs Harriers on the call here who are well aware of what harmful algal blooms are, but I think it's a good thing to review uh, for those of us who want to learn a little bit more. So although they're commonly referred to as algae or algal blooms, the organisms that form these blooms are actually cyanobacteria, which are single-celled bacteria that are ancient organisms thought to have evolved around 3.5 billion years ago. And we have a lot to thank these bacteria for actually because they're the oldest known oxygen producing organisms, or at least believed to be so, and they're responsible for creating our oxygen rich atmosphere uh, that we live in today. Now these cyanobacteria are a natural part of the aquatic community in lakes and ponds and oceans around the world. And there are many different taxa of cyanobacteria. The two most common bloom forming cyanobacteria that we seem to find on Cayuga Lake are microcystis and dolichospermum, which are pictured in the microscopic images on the right here. Now cyanobacteria can produce natural chemical compounds whose purposes are not fully understood yet, but we do know that some of these compounds are toxic to humans and other animals. And this is part of what makes a bloom harmful. Now, under certain conditions, these cyanobacteria, their populations can grow rapidly to form what we call a harmful algal bloom. And these blooms often look like uh, dense surface scums, like oily uh, streaks on the water, like spilled green paint, or like kind of like a pea soup appearance. And these dense surface accumulations of bacteria are different than the modest population growth that occurs as a natural seasonal cycle. So shown below is a chart showing the rough seasonal succession of phytoplankton populations in freshwater lakes. You can see that diatoms, which are a type of phytoplankton, their population naturally rises and falls in the early months of the year. And then that's followed by a rise and fall of the populations of green algae. And then starting in July and going through the warmest summer months of August and September, the population of cyanobacteria in freshwater lakes tends to naturally rise and fall. But again, this natural rise in population is different than the rapid growth and accumulation that leads to the formation of a bloom. And the factors that promote bloom formation are still under study, but there's general scientific consensus that cyanobacteria population growth increases at higher water temperatures, 
that high nutrient concentrations in the water, such as phosphorus and nitrogen, have been shown to promote cyanobacteria growth, and that still calm and stratified waters tend to facilitate the formation of dense surface blooms. Now, on the flip side of that, prevailing wind has also been shown to cause the accumulation of cyanobacteria on certain shorelines, which can also result in the formation of a bloom. And these factors can be very lake specific and even vary within a large lake, as we'll see a little bit today. So in 2017, many harmful algal blooms were reported on Cayuga Lake, causing great concern in the communities around the lake. And in response to this emerging water quality threat, the Cayuga Lake HABS monitoring program was formed. This program was designed and implemented by the Community Science Institute in collaboration with the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network and Discover Cayuga Lake. And the purposes of this program are twofold. The first is to provide timely information and hazard warnings to all who use Cayuga's waters. And the second is to develop information about the occurrence of harmful algal blooms, which may be useful in informing future responses and long-term management strategies. The program is a partnership of these organizations and a network of dedicated volunteers called HABS Harriers who monitor sections of shoreline around the lake and report their observations during the summer months. As many of you know, if a no bloom is observed during the volunteers weekly survey, a no bloom report is filed indicating that the shoreline is clear. However, if a suspicious bloom is observed, these volunteers report the bloom they collect a sample and they transport it to CSI's lab in Ithaca for analysis. Now here at CSI, we operate a New York State Department of Health and EPA certified water testing lab, allowing us to rapidly test all harmful algal bloom samples collected on Cayuga Lake. And the ability to test bloom samples at a local certified lab is a unique strength of Cayuga Lake's HABS monitoring program. It enables us to partner directly with volunteers of the program and to report regulatory quality HABs data in near to real time. Here at CSI's lab in Ithaca, bloom samples are analyzed to determine which type of cyanobacteria are present in the bloom sample, and also to determine the concentration of microcystin toxin. Now the measure of microcystin toxin is an important measure because it has implications for how much risk these blooms present on the lake. And there are two important numbers to remember here, and that are the safe guidance values or action limits set for microcystin. So 0 0.3 micrograms per liter is the safe guidance value for microcystin in drinking water, and four micrograms per liter is the safe guidance value or action limit for microcystis in surface water used for recreational purposes. Now, as we know, cyanobacteria may produce a variety of other toxic compounds. And so regardless of the microcystin concentration, you should always avoid any contact with a suspicious bloom. And finally, at the lab, we determine the concentration of total chlorophyll as a measure of bloom density. And this helps us to compare uh, different blooms from one another and compare the results uh, within a season. So when a volunteer reports a bloom on Cayuga Lake, we immediately post it on our public Cayuga Lake HABS reporting page. Then all of the results of lab analysis are reported on this page within 24 to 72 hours to provide quick hazard warnings and alerts and information to all who use Cayuga's waters. The reporting page features an interactive map showing where blooms occur, whereby you can click on one of these icons and it'll show pictures of the bloom taken by the volunteer and field observations that they recorded. And it will also show all of the results of laboratory analysis of the bloom sample. On the reporting page, we also have a complete table of bloom results uh, for all of the blooms that have occurred on the lake during the monitoring season. Now to further communicate the risk of harmful algal blooms and their presence on Cayuga Lake, 
The Cayuga Lake Watershed Network sends out weekly updates to the public around Cayuga Lake, summarizing recent bloom occurrence, which is a really valuable communication tool. And in addition, CSI shares our HABS data with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, who reports this data on their statewide NIHABS reporting system. So this year we had another successful monitoring season with some excellent program progress to report. We were able to adapt to the realities of COVID-19 by holding our volunteer training sessions online in June, which was a big adjustment, but it worked out in the end. And our volunteers did a wonderful job of continuing to get out there and monitor the lakeshore, uh, despite some of the difficulties that are going on in the world right now. So we had over 90 Habs Harrier volunteers who participated in the program this year. These volunteers monitored 83 zones around Cayuga Lake each week, together covering over 53% of the lake shore, including state parks, uh, municipal lakefront parks, natural areas, and other important public shorelines that are frequented by a lot of summer visitors and residents. We're also excited to announce that we published a harmful algal bloom information and reporting guide brochure that we stocked in brochure holders, which we installed at six lakefront parks this year, all around Cayuga Lake. Uh, pictured here is one of those brochure holders at Harris Park in the village of Cayuga. Um, and these brochures provide lake goers with information about what harmful algal blooms are, how to recognize them, and what to do if they see one. So we hope that they'll serve as an important tool to help educate and raise awareness about what harmful algal blooms are around the lake and to visitors of Cayuga Lake. We're also excited to announce that this year we collaborated with Dr. Ruth Richardson of Cornell's School of Civic and Environmental Engineering to help develop a rapid screening tool for assessing the microcystin toxin concentration in Cayuga Lake HABs. And following my discussion today, you'll hear an excellent presentation by Dr. Richardson on the work that they did this summer. And finally, recognizing that harmful algal blooms produce a variety of toxic compounds, CSI conducted an initial survey of anatoxin A, which is another known cyanotoxin, in blooms occurring on Cayuga Lake in 2020. This involved asking a few volunteers around the lake to collect special samples that were uh, preserved and transported to the lab immediately. And very shortly, we'll be analyzing these samples and publishing our results in our 2020 uh, Water Bulletin newsletter, which should come out in November. So this year, with a plan to ensure that we captured all early summer blooms, we began our monitoring season on July 1st. And as soon as the season began, we were off to a busy start. Um, in July, we had 24 cyanobacteria blooms. And notably this year, we observed an early occurrence of blooms in the northern end of the lake that had high concentrations of microcystin toxin. In fact, 24 of the in fact, of the 24 blooms that occurred in July, 14 had microcystin concentrations that exceeded the safe guidance value for microcystin and water used for recreation. Now you can see that in this chart here on the left, which shows the number of blooms that occurred each day in July of 2020. And they are grouped by their microcystin toxin concentration. So gray represents blooms for which we were unable to test for microcystin. Green represents blooms that had a microcystin concentration less than the drinking water action limit of 0.3 micrograms per liter. Black represents blooms with microcystin levels greater than the drinking water action limit, but less than the recreation limit of four micrograms per liter. And red represents blooms that exceeded all safe guidance values. So what we saw this year was the early occurrence of high toxin cyanobacteria blooms. And this differed from what we've seen in previous years, where 
most, if not all of the blooms that occurred in July were low toxin concentration or less than the drinking water limit. Um, so that's a really interesting observation to see this year. And as you can see in the map of blooms that occurred during July, while we did have blooms that occurred in the southern end in early July, which is similar to previous years, we had a lot more blooms that occurred in the northern end of the lake in July than we have had in previous years around the same time of the year. Um, and pictured in the upper right here is one of those high toxin blooms that occurred in early July in the northern end of the lake. In August, there were 22 cyanobacteria blooms. And this is interesting because in 2018 and 2019, we observed a lull of, in bloom activity in August. This year, however, blooms occurred steadily throughout the summer months, as you can see in the graph on the left there. Now, of the 22 blooms that occurred in August, 20 exceeded the safe guidance value for microcystin in water used for recreation. And all of the blooms that occurred in August exceeded the safe guidance value for drinking water. So they were all high toxin blooms. They occurred quite steadily throughout August. You can see on the map here that they occurred mostly within the northern half of the lake. But interestingly, this year we saw two blooms that occurred in August, which happened at the Cornell Sailing Center and on the shoreline of Stewart Park at the very southern end of the lake. And surprisingly, these blooms were actually high toxin microcystis dominant cyanobacteria blooms, uh, which differs from previous years where the southern end of the lake saw few, if any, high toxin blooms. Similar to our prior two years of monitoring blooms, many harmful algal blooms occurred in September. During this month, 27 blooms occurred, 20 of which had microcystin concentrations that exceeded all safe guidance values. A final bloom then occurred on October 9th near, the, uh, near Aurora. And you can see in this chart that there was a spike of bloom activity in early September. And this is very similar to what we've seen in our prior two years of bloom monitoring. Now, these Blooms that occurred in early September were especially concerning because they were noted to have a very widespread extent. Uh, for example, there was a bloom that occurred on September 8th near Union Springs that was reported to have roughly a two mile extent uh, along the shoreline, which is, is a very large bloom, uh, even for Cayuga Lake. And that, that bloom is pictured in the upper right hand corner here. So as you can see on the map of blooms that occurred in September here, uh, blooms generally occurred around many different shorelines on the lake during September, and all of them had relatively high uh, levels of microcystin toxin. Um, notably, again, we had more blooms in the southern end of the lake in September that occurred uh, that had high toxin concentrations. Uh, so that's, again, different what we saw from what we saw in 2019. So when we review the entire season, uh, as shown in this chart here of the number of blooms that occurred each day, uh, again, represented by their microcystin toxin concentration, we can see that HABs occurred steadily throughout the summer months this year. This year we had 35 days of bloom occurrence compared to 26 days in 2019. And this highlights that while the total number of blooms remained relatively the same this year, their occurrence was more spread out throughout the summer. You can see that we never really had a lull in bloom activity as we've had in previous years. What this chart also highlights is that high toxin microcystis dominant blooms began occurring much earlier this year than in previous years. And we observed a lot more of these high toxin blooms than we have in previous years. So these differences are highlighted especially well 
when we compare charts of bloom frequency for the past three years. So blooms that occurred in 2018 on the top, 2019 in the middle, and 2020 on the bottom there. You can see that in 2018 and again in 2019, we had spikes of bloom occurrence that occurred in early July and then in late September. And this was quite a regular pattern that we were seeing over these two years. And we we're also again seeing that lull in bloom activity in August. This year, these patterns remained relatively similar in the sense that in early July, we had a lot of bloom activity in the southern end of the lake that were Dolichospermum type blooms with low concentrations of microcystin toxin. And then in September, we had a spike of bloom activity that occurred in the northern end of the lake that had high concentrations of microcystin. Um, but it differed in the sense that these spikes of bloom activity were less intense and instead blooms were more spread out throughout the summer months. Uh, so kind of a steady low level of bloom activity throughout the summer. Now in recent years, many people have voiced their concern that harmful algal blooms are increasing on Cayuga Lake and whether or not this can be seen in the data that we've collected. Now scientists from across the world are collecting data that seems to suggest that the occurrence of HABs is in fact increasing. And in New York State, data collected by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation has shown that the number of water bodies where HABs occur across the state does seem to be on the rise. Here on Cayuga Lake, there's little in the way of historic harmful algal bloom data. You can see that in 2014 and 2015 and 2016, there were few, if any, confirmed harmful algal blooms on Cayuga Lake. In 2017, 24 suspicious blooms were reported to the DEC, and five of these blooms were confirmed as harmful algal blooms. This caused a lot of concern for this emerging water quality threat, and as I've said, in 2018, we formed our harmful algal bloom monitoring program on Cayuga Lake. In our first year, we monitored 30% of the Cayuga Lake shoreline, and we confirmed 40 cyanobacteria blooms. Then in 2019, we increased our shoreline coverage to 47%, and we confirmed 67 harmful algal blooms. And then this year in 2020, our shoreline coverage increased a little bit to 51%, or now 53%, since we've had some volunteers join throughout the summer. And we confirmed 74 harmful algal blooms on Cayuga Lake. So what we do know is that monitoring harmful algal blooms on Cayuga Lake has systematically improved over the past three years. We've steadily increased the amount of shoreline each year and improved our systems for reporting blooms as they occur, which is an actual excellent achievement for helping people address this issue on a day-to-day -day basis during the summer. We also know that the awareness for an understanding of harmful algal blooms have increased as well. So while the question of whether harmful algal blooms has increased on Cayuga Lake is still hard to answer, what we can say is that HABs may have increased on Cayuga Lake in recent years. It seems to look like they have, but that the awareness of the issue has also increased and that we are better at identifying and reporting these blooms. While the question of increasing blooms may be difficult to answer, there are some very interesting patterns that we see in harmful algal bloom data collected over the past few years. One of these findings is that while we recorded nearly the same number of harmful algal blooms on Cayuga Lake this summer, a far greater number of the blooms had high toxin, had high levels of microcystin toxin. So you can see that in this chart here, which shows all of the blooms that were recorded in 2018, 2019, and 2020. And they are again organized or represented uh, similarly by their microcystin toxin concentration. The one difference in this chart is that we included another category that shows blooms with microcystin levels greater than the action value for recreation but less than the DEC's 
high toxin classification for shoreline blooms. Um, but again, the red represents blooms that exceeded all safe guidance values. And what you can see here is that, well, again, we confirmed relatively the same number of blooms this year as we did in 2019. A far greater portion of these blooms had high toxin levels, which is, which is concerning in its own right. Um, in fact, 73% of blooms that occurred on 2020 exceeded the safe guidance values for microcystin toxin compared to 42% in 2019 and 55% in 2018. So this is a really interesting pattern to see. Uh, we hope it doesn't uh, continue on this track into the future, um, but we will be continuing to monitor it uh, in future years. Another important finding is that three years of bloom data reinforced the idea that microcystin toxin concentrations of blooms on Cayuga Lake seem to be associated with the type of cyanobacteria that forms the bloom. What you can see here is a graph with the bloom density on the horizontal axis and the toxin concentration on the vertical axis. And all of these dots here are all of the blooms that we've confirmed over the past three years. Now, instead on this graph, they are represented by the type of cyanobacteria that we found in the bloom. So the blue dots are blooms that were dominant with Dolichospermum type bacteria. The gray dots are those that had a mixed assemblage of cyanobacteria. They may have had some Dolichospermum, some microcystis, maybe some Planktothrix bacteria, but really a mixed community. And then the orange dots are harmful algal blooms that were really dominated by microcystis type bacteria. And what we can see here is that when microcystis type bacteria is present or dominates a bloom sample, the toxin concentration of that bloom seems to get much greater the greater the density or the size of the bloom. And this is a really interesting finding that could have some important management applications. Uh, for instance, we may be able to more quickly assess the blooms by taking a look at what type of cyanobacteria are in the bloom, and then using that, get a quick idea of what types of levels of toxin to expect in that bloom. Another important part of harmful algal bloom monitoring is understanding clearly where these blooms occur on Cayuga Lake. Below is a map showing all of the blooms that occurred on Cayuga Lake in 2020. And what we can see here are similar patterns of bloom occurrence as in previous years, whereby high toxin microcystis dominant blooms occurred mainly in the northern half of the lake. And Dolichospermum dominant blooms that have low toxin concentrations seem to occur exclusively in the southern end of the lake. Um, but what's different this year is that we can see that these high toxin blooms were a bit more spread out around the lake shore. We saw them at many different locations, not exclusive to the northern third of the lake. Um, for instance, near Aurora, south of Taganic Park, even on the shoreline of Stewart Park. And this is an interesting and somewhat concerning thing to see this year that really differed from 2019, where we saw high toxin blooms kind of exclusively occurring in the northern end of the lake. Um, additionally, you can see that there were many more high toxin blooms this year, again, uh, despite the fact that the total number of blooms this year was relatively the same. Um, and finally, you can see that this year 54 blooms occurred in the northern half of the lake, while only 20 blooms occurred in the southern half. Um, and this is interesting as well, um, because we want to understand why more blooms seem to be occurring in the northern end of the lake. <clears throat> and that brings us to our next question, that over the past three years, 
there's been a clear pattern of many high toxin microcystis dominant blooms occurring in the northern third of Cayuga Lake. And one question that we'd like to answer is what factors drive this spatial occurrence of harmful algal blooms? Shown below are two maps of the northern third of the lake. The one on the left shows the harmful algal blooms that we confirmed in 2020. And the one on the right is a nautical chart showing the depth of Cayuga Lake. Um, now you can see from this chart all of the harmful algal blooms that occurred up there. We had a lot of bloom activity this year. And on the map on the left, you can see that in this same area, Cayuga Lake starts to get much shallower than it does in other parts of the lake. Now, the shallow depth of the lake at this northern end could be, we don't know, but it could be a contributing factor that promotes the frequent occurrence of blooms here. And so to help answer this question, CSI has added two new water monitoring locations to the north end of the lake this summer to help us understand the water quality dynamics that might be contributing to this phenomenon. Um, and this year we had a few monitoring events where we collected data from these locations. Uh, and we did this in partnership with Cayuga Lake Environmental Action Now. And we are very excited to continue monitoring these locations with them uh, in the years to come. We would also like to better understand what factors promote harmful algal blooms on Cayuga Lake generally. And CSI is uniquely positioned to study this question through our Synoptic Stream and Lake Monitoring Program, which many of you may be aware of. Since 2003, we have partnered with over 100 volunteers to monitor locations on 18 sub-watersheds across the Cayuga Lake watershed. And together with their care and dedication, we have collected over 60,000 regulatory quality measurements of water quality from these sub-watersheds. Now through this program, we have found some interesting things, uh, one of which is that on average, nutrient concentrations seem to be higher in the northern sub-watersheds that we monitor compared to the southern sub-watersheds. Um, you can see that in these charts here on the right, which show the average concentration of two forms of phosphorus in the watersheds that we monitor. And the watersheds are organized from with the northern watersheds being on the top of the graphs and the southern sub-watersheds being on the bottom. Um, so again, this is kind of an unanswered question, but one thing that could be contributing to frequent bloom occurrence is greater nutrient availability at the northern end of Cayuga Lake. Um, but again, we need to look into this more and we're really interested to answer this question. So through our harmful algal bloom monitoring program, we've learned a lot, especially this year. Uh, we've learned that the number of high toxin blooms on Cayuga Lake in 2020 increased from 2019 and 2018. And this increase may be due in part to the increased shoreline coverage and our improved monitoring efforts. But the comparison between this year's data and the data collected in 2019 suggests that this increase may in fact be due to shifting assemblages of bloom forming cyanobacteria, such as the increased abundance of microcystis cyanobacteria in Cayuga Lake in 2020. Three years of bloom data have also reinforced the idea that microcystin toxin seems to be associated with a type of cyanobacteria that forms blooms on Cayuga Lake and also that cyanobacteria taxa seem to be somewhat spatially localized around the lake, exhibiting seasonal cycles of abundance. And together, these are really important findings because they suggest that cyanobacteria blooms present a great risk to the water quality of Cayuga Lake, especially at its northern end. But what's more is that by understanding the driving factors behind these patterns, we might be able to inform targeted management efforts to address harmful algal blooms. But we're always seeking to learn more. And some of the questions that we'd like to answer very soon are what are the factors that drive shifts in the cyanobacteria community 
such as the increased abundance of microcystis taxa in 2020? And also, what factors promote the frequent occurrence of high toxin blooms in the northern end of Cayuga Lake? So I'd like to thank you all for listening today. Again, a big thank you to all of our volunteers around the lake who have helped make this program possible for the past three years now. With your help, we are collecting some amazing data that's helping us to address this important water quality issue. So thank you, thank you, um, and thank you for listening today. I really appreciate this opportunity to present on our findings. Thanks, Nate. Thanks so much, Nate. Yeah, we did have um, a ha small handful of questions come in that I'd like to pose to you at this time. Uh, thanks so much, everyone who submitted them via the chat. Um, we'll start at the top. Uh, first question is, how many other certified water labs are there in the Finger Lakes region? Oh, there's very few, in fact. Um, I, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. I would say it's two at most three. Um, <coughs> but, I, you know, again, there may be one in the Finger Lakes region. Steve, would you comment on this? Yeah, I mean, Upstate Freshwater Institute certainly, um, you know, uh, are certified for the same, you know, for microcystin uh, and, and chlorophyll, uh, just as we are. Uh, and um, other than that, I'm not really sure. Uh, there are some uh, uh, drinking water labs uh, here and there, but uh, to answer the question, I really, I think it's just CSI and um, the Upstate Freshwater Institute when it comes to uh, looking at uh, cyanobacteria. I should mention the Finger Lakes Institute does do microscopy uh, of these of cyanobacteria blooms. Uh, I think they also are looking at microcystin. Nate, uh, remind me if they do. I think they're not certified for microcystin toxin just yet. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Finger Lakes Institute or FLI has started doing uh, microcystin toxin analysis this year, but I do not believe they're certified to do the test. Right. Certification of the uh, EPA method 546 is a bear. <laughs> the, the, um, uh, the controls are just uh, are very extensive and very hard to, uh, to manage. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, it it, it 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 is what it is. You know, it's it's just hard to do. But uh, you can get measurements without being certified, um, uh, and they are working towards certification. I'm sure. Okay, thank you. Next question is: As the number of years of HABs data collected grows, is there a way to analyze the data over the years? that takes into account the differing coverage of zones each year? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, really a great suggestion for looking at the Bloom data. Um, one way you could do that is just to uh, normalize the number of blooms that are documented each year uh, by our shoreline coverage. That'd be one way of looking at it. Another way it might be to look at, you know, zones where frequent blooms occur um, and zones where we haven't seen many blooms over the year and look at what types of differences in those zones there might be. But a great, a great suggestion and we'll take a look at that very soon. Okay, great. Next question for Nate is how many monitoring points were newly included this year and where are those locations? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we had monitoring zones that were added all around the lake, in fact. Um, I would say that the most coverage that we added this year was in the northern end of the lake, um, primarily on the Cayuga County shoreline. We had four or five new zones that were added there. Um, but additionally, on the Seneca County shoreline, we had a large zone that was added kind of midway through the summer that is helping us to uh, monitor a lot of shoreline on there as well. Um, but, you know, we have volunteers always joining 
kind of later in the summer, we had some volunteers join who uh, took over previously retired zones in the southern end of the lake, uh, such as just south of Taganic State Park and uh, the Ithaca Yacht Club. Great, okay, a uh, couple more questions. Where are the sampling sites with clean that will help determine how shallowness plays a role in the north end? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, not only, you know, shallowness, but water quality generally. Uh, those two locations are located uh, offshore of the village of Cayuga. So one of them is south of the railroad track crossing there uh, that kind of partitions off that northern bay of the lake. And the second location is kind of central in that northern bay of the lake uh, where we've seen a lot of blooms occur. Um, and so we're hoping to understand a little bit better the water quality in those parts of the lake um, and how they may relate to harmful algal bloom occurrence. Okay. Um, let me see a couple more. Do we have any measures of community awareness growing? Uh, the comment was, I was surprised to find neighbors who still didn't know about the threat to swimming. Oh, that's a great question. Um, th I think that's a hard thing to measure. Um, you know, what I kind of base it off of is how many public reports we see receive about harmful algal blooms during the summer months, um, how many new volunteers participate in the program each year, um, and just kind of general community feedback. I think it's a hard thing to measure, um, but hopefully it is increasing. And yeah, Hillary may have uh, some, some things to talk about on this. Well, it would be great to uh, figure out a way to quantify uh, how many people are paying attention. There was certainly a big change once we started a formal program in 2018 and started getting out regular weekly reports thanks to your data collection and our um, HABS updates that were sent out by our fabulous interns. And uh, I'd say, you know, it was a qualitative measure, but it was uh, um, the sense of fear by people uh, dropped. People were not emailing me at midnight anymore um, or um, quite so much and worrying about was the whole lake dead and that kind of a thing. I think it's that kind of uh, free floating anxiety that a lot of us are experiencing right now for other reasons. Um, that really hit hit a high point in 2017. And now that people know where to go for information, um, even if not everybody does, um, I, I think, I think um, com community understanding is much improved. But of course, there's still that really, really, really under important underlying question, which is, how can we stop this and go back to the normal good old days when we didn't have to check in advance before we went to the beat? And um, that's a longer question, but it's great the public's on top of that question. So um, here's one for you, Nate. Are any of the Finger Lakes free of HABs? Gosh, I would say no. Um, you know, I don't think they are from looking at the New York State DEC NIHABS reporting page this year. All of, you know, most of the Finger Lakes were very similar to us in the sense that they had a very busy summer with a lot of harmful algal blooms this year. Um, and I think it was announced by the DEC, in fact, last year that now all of the Finger Lakes have had re HABS reported on them. Um, I think one kind of interesting thing that people have noticed this year is that for some yet to be known reason, Seneca Lake has had fewer blooms this year than they've historically had in previous years. Um, and that's an interesting observation. They're still finishing up their monitoring season, so we'll have to see how it continues to unfold, um, but certainly an interesting, interesting comparison. Okay. We've got hey. We have time for just a couple more. Um, the next question is, have you done a correlation of HABs occurrence and depths on the south end? There is a shelf there and low depths is prevalent at the very southern tip. 
Yeah, that's another great question. Um, you know, I focused on the northern end specifically because that's where we see a lot of high toxin blooms throughout the summer months. Uh, but the southern end uh, is shallow as well, as people know. And uh, as we see in the data, the blooms that occur in the early summer months, especially in early July, uh, over these past three years, you know, in the early summer, they, they occur uh, in the southern end of the lake primarily. Uh, now, that was a little bit different this year. Um, but, you know, yeah, that's, that's something to be looked at as well. Okay, thanks, Nate. And one final question, and remember, we'll have time at the very end to uh, address any additional questions. But the last one for right now, is, I think a lot of people can relate to, especially this year. Uh, the comment is, I have seen an increased frequency and quantity of white foam on the lake. Any thoughts there about what that is and why it's occurring? Oh, yeah, a great question. Um, and something that we're going to have to increasingly look out for here, maybe. Um, we did have some volunteers report observations of that. Um, actually, in right around the time that we got our final bloom on Cayuga Lake on October 9th, uh, there was a lot of foam on the lake that day that volunteers reported. Um, you know, it's an interesting phenomenon. Foam can be uh, natural just from, you know, the natural dynamics and, and folding in of air into the water. Um, so can be naturally occurring. Um, you know, something interesting is that on Canandaigua Lake, they've had a lot of foam. Um, and recently, uh, they, you know, took a deeper look at that foam this year. Um, and they found that it may have connections to cyanobacteria, which is a very interesting finding. Um, and if you want to learn more about that, the Canandaigua Lake Association has information on the homepage of their website. Um, but yeah, certainly an interesting observation and something we'll have to continue to look out for here. That's great. All right. So, so Jen, uh, yes. just one moment before we move on, I would, uh, our funder, Okay, we couldn't have done this without funding. Uh, and so I'd like to thank, uh, be sure that we thank the um, uh, uh, Cayuga County, um, I'm sorry, Tompkins County Health Department, uh, which funded us, and uh, also the Fred L. Emerson Foundation. We got a grant from them uh, to work on hats this summer. So, uh, and we also uh, got some money from a GoFundMe page. Uh, so uh, that's how we, we, we sort of patched together the money to, uh, to uh, conduct the monitoring program, HAPS monitoring program this summer. So thank you to, uh, uh, to all of them. Yes, yeah, thank you to all of them. Absolutely, so important. Can't do this work without, without that support. Unfortunately, you can't do it without money, yeah. yeah. No doubt, no doubt. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hillary? Sure, uh, that was wonderful and illuminating. And I always love how much uh, you think you've told the whole story and then Nate, you show another slide with a whole nother aspect of it that and we say, oh yeah, right. That is just so helpful. And the graphics are, are really, really, really everybody to understand. Um, We'll, we'll um, give it a rest now and come back to you in about five minutes. So thanks, Nate, uh, very much. That was wonderful. Thank you.
Hey, Nate, are you there? Hey, yeah. Hey, do you mind unsharing your screen? Yeah, sure. Awesome, I think we're about ready to get, get rolling here. Jen, are you gonna share your screen or should I just go ahead and start my title slide? I'm gonna, I'm gonna share something real quick okay. and then we're gonna right. it over to you, Ruth. Um, Hillary's gonna do a little introduction. Got it. Just one minute, yeah. Hillary to pop back on here. 
I see her. Here she is. Okay, cool. So um, we are going to go ahead and pop into this next little thing as um, Nate mentioned. Um, we are all member um, organizations who rely on outside support to uh, do the work that we need to get done. I'm going to start my video as well. There we go. Um, and so I just wanted to take a moment to share with you some different ways that you can support the Kugel Lake Watershed Network. Um, and one of those is, uh, is joining our membership. Uh, those of you who are current members should be receiving your membership renewal in the mail um, early November. And anyone who's not a current member, you're welcome to visit our website and find out the different ways that you can contribute that way. Um, we will have uh, a Giving Tuesday campaign that's coming up um, early December. Uh, we have not revealed yet what our uh, campaign will be, but we look forward to doing that via our social media accounts, Facebook and Instagram, um, as time moves on. Um, if you are a social media follower, we'd love for you to follow our Facebook and Instagram accounts. Our YouTube account is fairly new this summer. We're working to populate it with some valuable and useful uh, videos and testimonials and informational pieces that you can uh, review at your leisure and share with others. Um, volunteering is always incredible. You just heard Nate's whole presentation. Uh, 90 plus volunteers couldn't do it without all of you. So if you have a little time to give and would like to become engaged in any uh, number of our volunteer opportunities, we invite you to consider uh, an Embrace the Lake cleanup, becoming a Habs Harrier. You can um, get a lake rake um, and look for hydrilla off, um, uh, off your shoreline if you happen to be a lakefront owner um, and, uh, and join up that way. You feel like you've got a little time to give back. Um, the Cuga Lake Watershed Network has also launched in collaboration with a number of lake associations, our Lake Friendly Living program, and we invite you to adopt some lake friendly living practices. Um, this is a no cost program available to anyone in the watershed, regardless of whether you live on the shoreline or not. Um, our website, again, cugalake.org, search for lake friendly living and you'll find ways that you can take the lake friendly living pledge. Uh, we'll send you a cool um, sticker um, as well as a beautiful yard sign that you can put up to show your support for um, for some healthy um, healthy uh, water practices. Um, so we invite you to do that. So again, you can check out our website, cugalake.org, um, anytime. And uh, thank you very much for listening to my little spiel. Hillary, it's off to you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Jen, and thanks, everybody. Um, this is going very well, um, and uh, I look forward to our next speaker, uh, Professor Ruth Richardson, who is beaming at us there. Uh, I first met Ruth uh, when I um, got the job as steward back in 2009 and was startled and thrilled to find that a young faculty member, who are usually overwhelmed with other things, was able to uh, be uh, a member of our board and to uh, be actively involved in local community matters. And that uh, was a thrill. And I've watched Ruth um, uh, over the years from a, a distance um, in her career at Cornell. And uh, she has kept that interest in local matters uh, and in helping um, us regular folks um, make use of technology and information um, to protect our lake and creek. So Ruth is gonna talk about a very interesting um, aspect of that that she's been working on. Thanks. Thank you so much, Hillary. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. Well, thanks for that introduction. You know, I'd say that this project is sort of uh, the, the best example of that. I've been interested in the watershed for a long time, and I was on the board for, I think, six years. Um, and this is probably the closest and the most relevant my research has gotten. So it's very, very exciting. Okay. 
Um, so I'm going to put my acknowledgement slides right up front because if I run out of time, I might not get here. Um, I'll just briefly touch on these and then hopefully there'll be a little more time to acknowledge people, but just to sort of first acknowledge our sponsors. Um, so the New York State Water Resources Institute sponsored this pilot program uh, in 2020. Um, and then they are getting the funds from the USGS. And then we had a little bit of money through Engage Cornell to do some outreach uh, specifically with the Science Center. So I won't be able to talk about that, but I first want to acknowledge my sponsors. And then a lot of these organizations that you're familiar with um, are partners in, in one form or another and all of my great students. All right, so I know that, that Nate did a great job of introducing cyanohabs or freshwater habs, um, which unlike marine habs tend to be caused by these cyanobacteria. So just a couple things that I wanted to mention about cyanobacteria, uh, they used to be called blue-green algae, some people do still call them uh, that, but they are actually a phylum, so this is a big group, <laughs> uh, a, a high order group um, of organisms, and they are bacteria, not true algae. Individual cell sizes tend to be between one and 10 micrometers, uh, but they grow colonially, and that's largely what we tend to see um, when we're talking about HABs here in the Finger Lakes. Some of them can regulate buoyancy. Um, they have these internal uh, gas storage vesicles that help them uh, move up in the water column to get in the photic zone. As Nate mentioned, they're natural members of aquatic communities, but when the wrong ones grow out of pace, um, they, there are some, some toxins that get produced and our sort of public enemy number one with respect to that is this microcystin um, toxin. And I was very excited to hear that CSI is starting to do some explorations into this other possible toxin, uh, the anatoxin, which won't come up with the microcystin uh, ELISA test. And the other really cool thing for, I'm a, you know, I'm an applied microbiology professor, really. Um, they're beautiful in their diversity. So these are just some of the players that we see around the Finger Lakes here. Um, and some of these we'll talk about later for sure. So the first uh, slide I wanted to sort of put up, this is the New York statewide HABs map uh, from 2020, assuming the season is over. Um, and for those of you who haven't been to this map, right, um, it essentially shows all the blooms that were detected and reported the whole season in 2020. And then the ones that are just highlighted are the most recent ones. They happen in the last two weeks, the ones that are outlined. Um, but anyway, our Finger Lakes region, right, we're, for better or worse, a pretty big hotspot uh, for this. Part of it is that we are observing an increase in, in incidents, but the other part is that volunteers, like many of the people here, are on, on the lookout now. But statewide, we are certainly um, on the map. Um, and then just to sort of summarize what, what happens, right, um, the HAB Harriers group here in Cayuga Lake do this, but anywhere around the state, right, a uh, volunteer will notice a bloom. Um, they will <clears throat> take a sample and record some metadata, depending on the, the zone they, or the lake, they might do, record different things. And then they have to send the sample to a certified lab, right? And as the, we talked about at the end during questions for me, there's not really that many um, around the Finger Lakes uh, that you can send it to. And that certified lab, um, I'll use the example of CSI. CSI first does a microscopy screen with an expert microscopist on a, on a high power um, light microscope, and then um, does certified testing for chlorophyll A and microcystin concentrations. So that's the sort of procedure that we're currently following. So the, the method, the certified method is an ELISA method sort of an antibody test. Uh, it needs to be done in certified labs. It's expensive. Um, some of the cheapest labs might, might charge $50, but it certainly goes up from there. And then relative to when you might want to recreate, the, the turnaround time is slow, right? Because you have to get the, the sample there, get the results back. The best that that can happen is, is a day. So there's a delay in knowing the toxicity and when it's safe, when or whether it's safe for recreation, so swimming, boating, or fishing. So we're, we are interested um, in, in developing some screening tools. We're not gonna go through the certification process um, at the state level, but like to give citizens um, or, or watershed groups some fast and inexpensive screening tools. 
So I like bringing this up. This is, uh, was out of Nate's presentation. And in fact, it is the version of this slide from last year that inspired um, sort of the project and the, and the toolkit that we're gonna be talking about today. But just to remind people, this was sort of the observation. This is now from three years of data on Cayuga Lake, log microsystem concentration, right? Or the microsystem concentration in log uh, scale. And then the total chlorophyll A concentration. So this is like overall bloom density, how dense of, a, of, of a, any sort of um, algae or cyanobacteria are present. And there was this very cool trend that Nate pointed out, which is if you have um, dolly or dolichospermum, uh, these curly Q organisms, um, the, there's essentially no trend at all. Even at very high density of blooms, we don't see a lot of microcystin toxin. Of course, it doesn't mean there's not anatoxin or something else there. But in terms of looking at the microcystin, right, the big um, culprit is microcystis. Um, so again, microcystin toxin correlates with bloom density when th these microcystis are present or dominant in the blooms. Uh, non-toxic blooms were never, or essentially never dominated, depending on where you draw your line. They were never dominated by microcystis. And so this key take home is microcystis is a major microsystem producer. Um, and the other key thing here, as in these, these microscopy pictures, is they are distinguishable if you are able to look under the microscope. So here's the workflow that we tried out on uh, Cayuga Lake and uh, also on Canandaigua Lake. I'll focus mostly on, on Cayuga results today. Uh, and then a little bit on Seneca. So we take a, a sample or a subsample. Um, I'm not showing here the fact that certified lab will do microcystin toxin levels, um, uh, chlorophyll A levels, and, and so on, all the normal things. But we get a subsample and we do two things with it. So these are really two kits. The top kit is the field microscope kit. And we have this uh, cheap, it's a $40 microscope. Um, we have developed a method where you can take a sample of your bloom, image it under these cheap scopes, um, and then we're working on image analysis to try to develop algorithms that will tell you based upon a photo whether it's potentially toxic or non-toxic, or even better, what level of toxicity you might be seeing. So that's our field microscope kit, or kit one. Um, and then the second one I'll talk about today is the qPCR kit. So this is a molecular diagnostic kit. Um, it, you essentially take a small sample, you filter it to concentrate onto a filter. You have a, a, like a, a shelf-stable DNA RNA extraction kit, so you can get all the nucleic acids um, for genetic analysis out of that, that filter. Um, and then this device, I know I'm presenting, but you might not be able to see my face, but I have this sort of $8,000 device in my hand, um, and it can do up to nine samples. So you can quantify gene levels. So the idea is if we have the microcystis or the toxic microcystis level um, measured, it's going to correlate with, with toxin level. So those are the two I'm going to talk about. I will spend more time on the top one because that's the one that I think um, is most exciting for sort of broad use, but I will present some of our preliminary work um, on the, the method two, the second method. So this is just sort of a summary of the sample analysis. Um, I'll, I'll start actually down here first. So the Hab Harrier program in Cayuga Lake, um, folks, as the program has been working over the last couple of years, you see a bloom, you make a report, and you deliver it to, to CSI. And they'll do microsystem tests and all those other things. Um, and then we were siphoning off a lot of those. So Nate uh, would call, uh, or we'd call Nate and say, hey, can we get a, a small subsample of that? And our lab was doing the toxin gene test and, and cheap scope microscopy. Some of you, right, those people that were actually sort of mentioned, and I'll, I'll acknowledge them a little bit later, some of the Hab, Hab Harriers volunteers and volunteers on Canandaigua were willing to try out our microscope this year, and so they were doing some direct cheap scope microscopy. The second type, of, so, this, so this is bloom samples, typical bloom monitoring programs on the different lakes. And then we also did some weekly timed samples. Um, and the map over here is showing the, the Finger Lakes region, right, or a zoom in of the three lakes that we worked on. Um, and we had four locations, two in the north and two towards the, in the southern end. 
So this is Northeast uh, Cayuga Lake State Park, Taganic State Park, and East Shore Marina. Um, on Seneca, we had one location, and then on Canandaigua, we had four locations. Um, and so we were taking regular samples regardless of whether there was a bloom there or not. So these are two types of samples. Again, I'm mostly going to focus in on the bottom ones, but I will show you at least one slide, a, a couple slides with respect to these weekly time samples. So they're a little bit different. Not only are they just taken on the day we plan to take them, they're also integrated samples. So we have here in the upper right, we have our student, our summer student, Chloe, and she is holding one of these dip samplers um, where you can actually go down as far as the 10 feet um, so that you can get like a near sediment sample, but you also can deploy it up at the, up at the surface. So we weekly or bi-weekly, depending on the lake, took an integrated, like the first two feet of surface water from these locations, and then also dropped our dipper down to the bottom. Uh, so it was right above the sediment and took two feet down there. So we had a, a surface sample and a bottom sample. So some of the reasons we wanted to do this are we wanted to we want to see what are the patterns of HABs across the season, not just like when someone sees a bloom or sees no bloom and, and reports that. We actually want to go and get samples with some regularity. And then another big question for people is like, what is the baseline non-bloom level of HABs or I guess more appropriately, microcystin? Or should we be worried about swimming in water, for example, that we don't really see it as a bloom, but people haven't been measuring that so much? So I'll just show this one um, figure here. Uh, this again, we just finished our season, so we're we're hot off the press with a lot of these results. Um, but one thing I'll sort of say: so here you're looking at the log concentration, so log base of so, uh, zero. This is a concentration of one microgram per liter um, in the bottom, right? So near the sediments, um, and then also the sort of surface integrated sample. And so we were sort of interested, again, there's this buoyancy factor. Are there any sort of trends or the differences between the bottom and the top? Um, and the bottom line, no pun intended, is we, you know, if we look at the data overall, there seems to be like a pretty good distribution in these background samples of toxin level in both the surface and, and in the bottom. Um, and then in terms of the overall levels, you can see we have uh, crosshairs here for that four microgram per liter rec limit. Um, we only had a few of these random grab samples. Um, they were all from Cayuga uh, that wound up being above that recreational limit. But the majority of samples are either below that recreational limit or below the drinking limit, um, which also is, is usually what is recorded as the, uh, the detection limit. So anyway, for the most part, when we randomly went in and got samples, um, we didn't see uh, uh, high toxin levels. Okay, so part one. So we're going to get into talking about the scope kit. So those, the folks that were on our team, um, both citizen volunteers and our students and myself would have these kits. So the main workhorse is this cheap uh, $40 microscope, uh, which has Wi-Fi capabilities. Um, and then we also gave the volunteers some um, accoutrements to sort of help with the, the imaging. We have a, just a simple bottle here where they could take a subsample of a bloom that they saw or a non-bloom sample. Um, they could sort of pour a little bit in there. They use the squirter to put four to five milliliters, like 4.5 milliliters, um, into a, a set Petri dish. And then they could set the microscope with its protective uh, sort of acrylic had right in the sample, and that's how we had them take pictures. Now we had them put a couple things in the background. Some images we wanted to have the black background, and as you'll see, that can help with some contrast for what we're seeing. Um, but then we also wanted to make sure we had the right scale, so we gave people um, a, like a 500 micron, so this is a half a millimeter grid that they could take pictures on. The other things that are needed, you do need some sort of device to take pictures on. It could be a phone, it could be a, a computer, um, and you don't need the, the Wi-Fi. So it was COVID, right? So we were kicking off this project and thankfully we had a kit that was mobile. So we didn't have to shut down entirely, but we did have to train people online. 
so we did a, a, a various things. We had um, some videos made up about sort of basic operation and how to take a picture. Um, we had some troubleshooting um, sheets that we shared. And then we had weekly Zooms every Friday morning. Um, people could sort of uh, Zoom in and uh, talk about what they're seeing, share some images and so on. So the, I didn't realize, I didn't capture good pictures of both groups. This is the Canandaigua group um, uh, at our intro session there. And then these are a couple of our volunteers here. So this is Sue Ruloff and these, this is Shelly and, and Cy Meyer. Um, and those are two of the, the head harriers here. And I'll say, you know, they both, this is coincidental, these are the people I have pictures of, but Sue gets the award for taking the most pictures of nothing, because her zone didn't have a lot of problems. And Shelly and Sai get the award for taking the most pictures of something. Um, I think they landed at 15 blooms in 2020. All right, so each volunteer would take uh, a series of video or pictures and video, so with their little cheap scope, um, right in their sample. We took pictures and video with a, a grid as the background or a white background, and then also with the black background. So I'm hoping, I might have to stop sharing to make these videos work. Oops, not stare, stop sharing, sorry. Well, here we go. So what I'm gonna show you, this is just an example, right, with the grid in the background. Um, of three samples we took. For one, this is actually from Sue, Sue Roloff's own. This is a non-bloom, but thankfully our volunteers, because we wanted to establish a baseline and make sure we don't see anything, right? You're not seeing anything and that's the intent there, good background sample. And then we have two actual sort of bloom samples from different zones. This one here had a microsystem level of 1.3, right? So this is between the, the drinking and rec limit. And it might, it gets a little choppy as you sort of move around, but you can sort of see, right, what you're seeing there, and there's not a lot of it, but those are microcystis dominated blooms that you're seeing there. Um, and according to CSI's microscopist, Adriana, this, you know, on the, on the even more powerful microscope had very sparse microcystis, and in fact, that's what we're seeing when we look in the cheap scopes. And then the other sample I have here has a high, uh, a high toxin level bloom, so about 100 in the microsystem level. Um, and I'll show you this one. All right, so this one um, in Adriana's notes where it had moderate microcystis, again, the, the, the sort of weird shaped things that you see, those in the microcystis. And then there are a couple of other ones here, and I'll pause just for a sec. That's playing the other video. <laughs> But you'll see here, this curly, this is a curly Q, one of these sparse delicates for a moment. But you can see immediately that there's lots of different sort of colonies, um, and there are these crazy shapes. One thing about microcystis, um, when they form colonies, they form very unusual shapes. Um, and then the other thing I'll sort of point out is there's some that have the right shape but a different color, and that's one of the things that we're very, very curious about, is what does that mean? Are those still the bad guys? Okay, so overall, we have a map over here of Cayuga Lake. These are all the bloom samples that we were able to work with CSI to get a subsample of. And then um, these black background images, right? And so some of the things that you sort of notice is there are some color variations, even though we all had, gave, you know, all took the picture with the black background. Um, and that is something that we have to work out in terms of our image analysis. Okay, so this is a whole bunch of pictures here, but what I did is I picked a few that were at different levels of toxin. So at or below the rec limit here, so less than four micrograms per liter, right? So here's an example. Mostly what we see is very sparse samples. Where we do see things, we see more of the curly Q type, these dolichospermum. I'd say our one big exception here, so this is an interesting one where it is very, very dense but it is all dolichospermum. So this is a very dense bloom that had very low, only one microgram per liter of toxin because it had the wrong players. In the next category, I went from four to about 50 micrograms per liter. So we're getting into the very high toxin level here. Okay, so you get some idea of the pictures that we're getting. And then this group is the real problem sample. So these range from about 50 on up to 1500 plus, okay? So 
some of the other cool things that are coming out of the pictures. We have zebra mussels. These are zebra mussel nymphs. Pardon me if I get the wrong bio term uh, going on here. So we do actually see those um, in some of our locations coming up right in the midst of the blooms and the colonies. So those are, that's a, again, sort of hot off the press. We just finished the season, but we are already working on image analysis. Uh, so this would be an example here. If this picture sort of came in, um, we're using some free software uh, called ImageJ. And some of the things that we wanna know is one, how dense is the bloom overall? We think that that's going to correlate to chlorophyll A levels. And then beyond that, which is a little bit trickier, is once we have the software identify individual colonies, we can do some color and shape analysis. And so that's a lot of what we're sort of uh, working on with our uh, Cornell students this semester. All right, so in conclusion for part one, Based on uh, the trends, including what Nate shared with you in the Finger Lakes region, monitoring microcystis colonies is a promising, uh, promising in the uh, screening tool. And the density and the color of the colonies has the potential to predict the, the toxin level once we work out our image analysis uh, software. And we definitely have ongoing work. We're finishing image analysis. Uh, we're working on sorting colonies by that color to establish which colony types contain uh, the problem children, those microcystis. We have some that we know do, but there are, there are others that are sort of off color uh, and we want to confirm whether they do or don't have toxic microcystis in them. Um, and this is just sort of an, an example again of these two blooms. This is a non-toxic bloom and a toxic bloom taken about the same week with about the same overall level. Um, and again, you can see that there's a shape difference here between these toxic colonies and those non-toxic types. All right, how much time do I have? So I'm not, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this one. So this is more of a molecular tool. This is not nearly as cheap um, of a method, but it does allow us to ask um, sort of more detailed biological questions. Um, so we, uh, just to remind people in terms of the, the flow of life, we have, you know, for anything that gets produced in this end, in this case, we're looking at microcystins. Well, to produce microcystins, you need the right enzymes. To make the right enzymes, you have to have the right genes and you have to have this intermediate um, of ribosomal RNA or RNA. So our method, we're working on detecting both gene copies in DNA and we call them transcript copies or like expression level um, which is the RNA. And I won't talk about RNA today. That's, that's um, on our to-do list for the coming months. So again, this is the workflow I'm talking about. It takes about an hour and, and $20 in consumables um, per sample. And I, this is the microcystin molecule. So we did spend some time up front thinking about um, which genes we should go after. Um, and we did, I'll just sort of jump to the chase here. We chose this MCYA as a really good candidate um, because it's present in all organisms producing any type of, of microcystin. So this gene called MCYA is what we'll refer to in the, in the following slide. All right, so in terms of correlation between microcystin levels and the MCYA level, I'm showing you one plot here. So this is a, with our handheld device, the results. And you have log of the toxin concentration here and the log of our gene copy here in copies per milliliter of water that we actually processed. And I have the drinking water limit and the rec limit here. So the red ones we call normal, meaning we got a result and it was a quantifiable amount, right? So a lot of red dots. And then we had ones that were undetectable or detectable, but below our quantification limit. So those are blue. So we, we essentially put these values here at whatever our exact quantification limit was for that assay that day. So they're not real values, right? But the bottom line that you can see is for the majority of samples that were above the rec limit, we definitely got a quantifiable signal. So this chart over here just summarizes that. So if we have, if our, the result from CSI was positive with the ELISA test for high toxins, so four or greater. 
in 30 of those cases, we got a positive with our qPCR method. And only in two of those cases, right, we actually had a negative. So this would be a false negative. When we had a negative for the ELISA, meaning the toxin was below four, um, we did have two cases where we still detected the gene, quantified the gene, um, so those would be false positives, whereas nine, we had agreement, right? So we wind up getting um, pretty good sensitivity and specificity just in terms of this qualitative high tox um, above four, above the rec limit or not. Okay, so conclusions for part two for the lab kit two, the field Key PCR kit is able to capture most of the toxic blooms. It had 94% sensitivity and 82% specificity. And we're not done going through our catalog of, of samples just yet. So we're, we're still working um, on getting final numbers there. Uh, and then we are concerned about false negative samples. That's always a concern if, you, if your test implies there's not a problem, but there really is. RNA, as I mentioned, is something that we're really working on. We think it's a bet has better predictive power um, and might allow us to come up with even a correlation there where you could predict actual quantitation for the toxins. In terms of ongoing work, in, in addition to RNA, we're also testing for other toxin genes, um, or we, we, we hope to be able to test for other toxin genes, so like anatoxin genes, for example. And then we're very interested in community analysis um, of these colonies to understand the ecology better. All right, so the overall takeaway, um, you know, in terms of uh, accessibility and expense and, and simplicity and, and rapidness, the cheap scope method definitely seems to hold promise, um, even down below that four microgram per liter limit. And please be on the lookout. We are hoping to fund the second year of this program, and we would love to get more of you involved. Um, and then the other thing I'll put in as a pitch, because the microscope is not just useful for this. You can look at all sorts of cool things um, under the microscope with it. And I'll let you all guess what those things are. All right, and so I, I guess I'll put up my acknowledgement slide here. Um, and welcome, because I think I've run out of time, um, any sort of questions. Maybe Jen has, can summarize some chat questions. Yes, hi. This is Go ahead, Hillary. Okay. Um, I've received one, one question. Um, question for Ruth. Are there other microorganisms existing within Cayuga Lake HABs? or do the HABs exclusively contain microcystis and or dolichospermum? Oh, a little bit. Yeah. If there are other micro <laughs> microorganisms, how do they impact your sample-PCR-image analysis methods? Great question. That, I love when a question lets me bring my back matter up. <laughs> my what if people ask about that. I, and I do think, you know, when we start to look at these colonies, um, that have different color, but the right shape for microcystis, that's the ones that are most exciting to me. So first of all, these are just some of the other organisms that um, Adriana has found or has reported finding in, in blooms. They're not as common um, as the two major ones, which are microcystis and dolichospermum. So we have a Lamnorapsis afanazememnon, I can never say this one right, uh, Warrenchinia. Uh, and you actually can see Dolico here, the curly cues. Um, and then the one I really want to sort of bring up is pseudo anabina. Um, and I didn't mention this. We did some uh, community analysis work back in 2018 uh, that I didn't share today. But we we have reason to believe that these pseudo anabina, which are these kind of more like um, rod shaped uh, cells on the outside here, are attracted to or have some relationship with the microcystis at the core. So it's almost like a gobstopper is one of the ways that I'm sort of describing it. It's like, there is a microcystis core here, but there are other organisms that, that seem to um, affiliate there. And so far, I don't see any evidence of like dolichospermum and microcystis playing together. Um, so it, it leads me to believe that this is something real and we don't ecologically know exactly what's going on. A good question. 
Great, thanks. We do have um, a few questions that have come into the chat, Ruth. Uh, the first huh? is if you could please repeat the chief scope conclusions to date. Sure. So, um, I mean, th this isn't so much, the first point isn't much about the scopes per se, it's about the general trend um, that, that the Cayuga Lake has had. Um, and then the, the, let me actually, it might even be better just to sort of go through the, the pictures here. So the, the bottom line is if we have very low levels, we often can still see some, um, some algae there. We, but we don't see the sort of screaming globby type colonies of microcystis, okay? And that even occurred with a sample that was very dense, but didn't have microcystis present. Then we have um, sort of these middling values where we, all, we always see some level of microcystis when we look under the microscope. It might be mixed with other things, but like, but the eye can see this and determine right, that we see a good amount of colonies that are these irregular blobs. Um, and then when you get to very high levels, it's clear and, and they almost crowd each other out in, in the view that you get. So the main take home from the cheap scopes is even at, at pretty low levels relative to some of these very high toxin blooms, a, a cheap microscope image um, or short video would definitely tell us whether you had a problem or not. I hope that answered it. But we're trying to codify all these numbers um, and that's the main challenge for us is our eye can see that there's colonies there, but if we wanted to make this something where someone in Lake Chautauqua wants to upload an image and determine if it's toxic, we have to, we can't man the phones the whole time. Next question is, is the image work now producing results or still being developed? We, so we have, um, we do have results now, I just didn't get a chance to summarize them, where we have all the images I showed you, um, we've now sent through this where the software will identify colonies from away from the background, and we're working on the black images mostly. And then for, they call those then regions of interest. So this is a zoom in here, um, and we then, we also have information about the blue pixel intensity, the green pixel intensity, the red pixel intensity of each of these regions. And those are gonna help us set some like limits for what are those real kind of screaming microcystis colonies. Um, so we are, we do already have these scripts running. Um, okay. But we welcome anyone has in, uh, experience with high tech image analysis or machine learning is, is another sort of route that we could go with these images. Okay, the next question is, have we seen a change in the community assemblage year to year? I, since we've only watched this year, but I have watched the, the spreadsheets and Adriana's good work identifying things, I, I think that um, generally the players are the players. I think there are certain locations that have some of those more, you know, consistent patterns, like the folks at the north end of the lake definitely have a lot of microcystis up there. Absolutely have it. Um, I think one trend that Nate sort of pointed out today is like surprisingly some of the southern end locations that usually in years past have had dolphospermum dominating are now getting microcystis in there. Did I interpret that right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. That's something surprising that we saw this year. Those southern locations where blooms in the past two years have typically been mostly dolichospermum, uh, we saw some microcystis this year. Yeah. So, and and I just like to add to that that you know Adriana has been uh, conducting uh, a phytoplankton survey again this year at eight locations around Cayuga Lake. Uh, the 2019 phytoplankton survey was published in our 2019 uh, fall uh, water bulletin newsletter and uh, we will publish the 2020 results this year um, and uh, so again 
her plankton survey is under non-bloom conditions. So looking at her non-bloom samples and comparing them to the HABs uh, samples uh, is interesting and instructive. Steve, is this the slide that you're, the figure you're talking about? Yes, I think that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, you're welcome. I didn't put it in, but I almost, I almost copied it in. Um, yeah. That, that, that's last year's. I think, well, I, I don't know. I, I don't think Adriana is quite done with this year's analysis yet. And uh, okay. so, uh, I, I can't comment uh, on 2020 yet. Great. Just a couple more questions and then we're going to wrap up here. Um, on a scale of one to 10, uh, how concerned are you about the frequency of blooms in Cayuga? And what are your predictions for 2021? based on what you know? I'm sure Ruth or Steve, you know, I think that's an appropriate question for anyone to weigh in on. I'll let the uh, experts who've watched for multiple years start off. <laughs> well, you know, the, the blooms that occur on Cayuga Lake are of course concerning. You know, they represent a, a threat to the water quality on Cayuga Lake and a risk to the people who use that water, of course. Um, and so that is, we are concerned about that. Um, as I said in my presentation before, you know, we've only been doing, we, you know, we've been doing this monitoring program on Cayuga Lake, this comprehensive HABS monitoring program for three years now. And we've already got a lot of wonderful data about harmful algal blooms, um, but we've only been doing it for three years. Um, so it's hard to say you know, whether the blooms will, are increasing year to year. Um, it certainly seems like from people's observations of the lake that, uh, you know, the number of blooms is increasing, um, but it's just hard to predict. Okay, anyone else wanna weigh in? Oh, Steve, you're muted. Yes, I agree with Nate, it's just hard to predict. We have three years of data, and that's great, but it's only three years. And so what happens next year? Uh, I, I think we'll just have to wait and see. Okay, thanks. Too much. You could, yeah, the, the, oh, weather, the weather is a big player also, I think. Uh, you know, the, yeah. who can predict the weather next summer? But that is something that um, does at least seem to be very important in, in people seeing the surface blooms that they grab and, and, and report. Yes, it's a big factor. Yep. Okay, uh, here's a good one. Would cheap scope methods quantify microcystin or microcystis? Microcystis. Thank you, okay. Uh, and then the final question um, before we move on will be, will you be enrolling more volunteers for the inexpensive scope strategy for monitoring in 2021? Yes, if we can find the very modest funding that we need for it, I certainly plan to, yes. All right, great, thanks. Those are all the questions that have come into the chat so far. Um, thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you, guys, it's been great. Okay, Hillary, you ready to think. move on? Okay. Um, Jen, could you put up the first of the two slides? Yep. Thank you. Hold on. Great. Hold on. Do, 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 do. There we go. Yeah. Um, this is a, a sort of exciting event here. Uh, the Cube Lake Watershed Network, um, during its 20 something year uh, existence, has uh, developed a couple of nice uh, prizes to recognize. Um, people's work. Um, you, you may be familiar with the David Morehouse Award, which we've handed out regularly over the years to a fantastic array of people who have put in a lot of years and a lot of work um, on behalf of our beautiful lake and watershed. And um, right now we are also working on updating um, our Lake Friendly Farms Award, which was used uh, to great effect to recognize um, farms that are doing good work along the lake. And we've found that that, that um, is um, 
some people have been asking us, would we please start that up again? And so uh, we've got David Wolf and others working on updating it and we'll, we'll launch it soon. And so um, here we have the James C. White Memorial Prize. Um, which was established uh, spring of 2019. Now I'll, I'll read to you a little bit here. Uh, Dr. James C. White, known to many as Jim White, a longtime Lakeshore resident and lover of the lake, was uh, the founding chair of the Cuga Lake Watershed Network in 1997 and 98. And after his death, um, his family and friends and the network um, decided to um, create a memorial fund or endowment to um, recognize uh, someone who has made notable efforts on behalf of the lake with a possible emphasis on younger persons. And um, in the uh, formal citation that I've written here, um, we've got some more information for you about um, the focused on Jim White's achievements as uh, pulling together and creating this organization. And uh, we'll share that language with you online and in our newsletter. <clears throat> so uh, cutting to the chase though, uh, the prize criteria, nominees should be individual or entities who in the spirit of Dr. White have made outstanding contributions uh, to the network to preserve and enhance the watershed. Nominees should reside in the watershed seasonally or year round. It is preferred but not necessary that nominees be representative of the younger generation of volunteers, network members, community members. Board members, network staff members, and members of the network's award committee shall not be eligible for nomination while they are actively serving in one of these capacities. And this is what brings us here today. The prize is announced and conferred at one of the two annual conferences organized by the network. So with a virtual drum roll, Jen, could you unveil the second slide? Jen, we need the second slide. Hmm? Drama, why? Look at that. And we capture his smile live, folks. This is pretty good stuff here, Nate. What do you think? Um, we would, we are really thrilled to uh, um, honor Nathaniel Nate Lawner as a recipient of the 2020 James C. White Memorial Prize. Um, probably most of you attending this meeting today know, I mean, if you didn't already know, you know, after seeing his presentation, um, how deeply Nate deserves this recognition. Um, his formal job title, I just summarized in this slide. Jen um, uh, reminded me late last night, I, I piled up this slide uh, with so much information about all the things Nate is doing that we got down to an eight point uh, font and it would have been nasty for all of you. But um, I have just here briefly summarized what Nate does with his two main hats uh, with the Community Science Institute, but he also does so much more and is so generous uh, and so quickly responsive and uh, thoughtful and kind to everyone, a photographer and a real team player. Um, that, that's just been astonishing to see. And by team, you know, I mean the network that is all of us. It's um, Nate, um, um, we'll stop here for now as I've written at the bottom here because we know that you're just getting started and it will be fantastic to see uh, what you do in your career. Um, but right now you're here with us and we want to thank you for all you've done for all of us and our beloved lake and creeks just in the past few years and you deeply deserve the first James C. White Memorial Prize. Say something. Thank you, Hillary, and and thank you, Jen, and all of the Cuga Lake Watershed Network. I'm I'm really honored to receive the James C. White Memorial Prize, and and to be thought of as having memorialized his spirit and and care for the lake. I'm really honored by that. So thank you. Um, 
Gosh, uh, well, all I have to say really, I guess, is that, you know, when you talk about being a team player, um, I mean, it, it really feels like a team and a, a community that cares for Cayuga Lake, especially, you know, having joined this wonderful network of volunteers who monitor blooms in the summer months and our volunteers who monitor the streams around the lake. You know, I, I feel really honored having moved here just two years ago to be so quickly accepted into this community and be able to, to work for this community. So I, I'm really honored by this award. Thank you so much. I, it's greatly appreciated. Great. Well, we're, we're having a handsome little plaque made for you. And uh, to go with it, I've got um, a nice Finger Lakes um, um, item for you that um, I'll share with you. Drop by in a socially distancing way uh, at CSI in the next few weeks. Okay? Well, thank so, you so much. I, I'm deeply honored. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> You just walked in and um, um, did everything that was needed right away and immediately, and then you have built so much since then, working with Steve and CSI and all of us. And uh, it's really been um, a thrill. Um, so um, I think uh, everyone, oh, oh, also, Nate, you better check the chat because there's some nice comments there for you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, we seem to have uh, successfully um, made it through this inaugural um, meeting of the um, fall community conference, and Jen has now posted um, our flyer for the upcoming November 4th um, event, which will be focused around uh, Hydrilla on Cuga Lake. Um, we usually do this as a, you know, in-person small meeting, uh, usually around the southern third of the lake uh, in November. And uh, talking to all the folks involved with hydrilla monitoring, treatment, and so on, we figured we would make it a, um, the second um, installment of our commun fall community conference. And we'll be hearing from um, Bob Johnson, who's been doing the astonishing monitoring of hydrilla and everything else um, via a big grid across the southern part of the lake. Uh, Kate uh, Desjardin Monticelli, who works with the Finger Lakes Institute, who will give us a sense of what they've done on Cuga Lake, but also the broader hydrilla problem. Um, in New York. And then Mike Greer, um, a fellow geographer, I like to point out, with the Army Corps of Engineers in Buffalo, who will tell us about uh, the Army Corps um, treatment process at several sites around Cuga Lake and um, talk about prospects uh, for the future. And then you'll see down at the very bottom, our third and final virtual community conference session will be our 2020 annual meeting for our members um, and introduction to our new strategic plan that will be held um, on November 8th. So you'll be hearing about all this um, via the usual channels. Okay, so I think we'll end the formal part of this meeting now, um, but uh, Ruth and Nate have agreed to stay around a little bit longer um, to answer any other questions you may have. So you can do it via chat if you're feeling shy or you can actually um, unmute yourself and ask the question. All right, let's see how this goes, huh? Let's check the chat first. It's brimming with good comments. Yeah, Lynn, Zoom makes it possible. Aren't we lucky? Yes, we've had a rough, rough, rough time, but this is um, a wonderful uh, thing to be able to do. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, you bet. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, okay, uh, looks like 
I'm not seeing any uh, hot questions popping up here. Could I ask a question? Yes, uh, John. Yes, please. Uh, I wanted to ask the question of Nate. Um, you know, we repeatedly see the seasonal variation of, um, of the, the various uh, micro populations. Um, and I wonder uh, for freshwater lakes, and I wonder if that uh, same seasonal variation applies in the southern part of the United States in the freshwater lakes, or is, is it different because of the uh, climate uh, and, and weather differences? And, uh... Uh, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, you're referring to the, the chart I showed in the beginning showing the seasonal succession of phytoplankton? Right. Exactly. right. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I'm not sure. I'll look into it. Um, it, it very well could be different. Um, primarily, maybe it's, I, I would guess it might be shifted to earlier in the year because possibly it gets warmer and stays warmer uh, earlier in the year in, you know, more southerly climates. Um, so, but I haven't looked into it, um, but it would be interesting to check out. Yeah. I have a question. Um, let's see. Uh, Louise Mudrock. Um, this is just curious. Um, have have any uh, either of you presenters been um, much in touch with folks in the Midwest about um, their trends and their are they monitoring? Are they um, you know to put our Finger Lakes in a little bigger context? I know they've been grappling with HABs for quite a long time. I'm just really curious um, if there's any sense of their trending. I know their lakes tend to be a lot shallower, um, much shallower, very agriculturally uh, ensconced, I would say. And just curious if either of you have any sense of that. We haven't been in uh, communication with anyone you know, directly, you know, monitoring uh, blooms in the Midwest or out West. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think some of these Midwestern states were some of the first to really tackle these harmful algal blooms, um, especially in uh, reservoirs primarily that are used for the town's drinking water in Midwestern states. Um, so I think they may have a lot of lessons to teach about, you know, how to, how to manage these blooms. Um, but no, we haven't been in, in contact with anyone. Yeah. Else. Well, you've got a full plate and congratulations, Nate. Yeah. Uh, uh, during uh, 2018 and 2019, when we didn't have so many other things on our mind, um, we were able to better track and take part in uh, national discussions of the harmful algal blooms problem. Um, I haven't seen so much about that this year, but again, I haven't had the time to look. Um, right. Yeah. There was a, a really great um, uh, Seattle-based media uh, group that Oops. nationwide, and of course, as you know, Louise, it is a terrible problem, um, and um, we, in terms of water quality impacts, um, and it's growing as a global problem and is linked to climate change and all of those things. Um, but I, I think um, it'll be interesting to see, and you know, I haven't seen it yet, is our sort of bellwether here is to see what happened in Lake Erie this year. And I, um, I don't think I've seen that yet because they have had such terrible problems, especially, um, Whoops, having a senior moment here. The the city in the uh, far hmm. west. Toledo? Huh? Toledo? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, which has a large, um, uh, you know, it's dependent on the river water that comes from. Yeah. Inland. And um, yeah. they had to uh, turn off their water a couple, few years ago. She went, went dark. dark. I mean, so uh, they may have got. Hmm? Go ahead. 
Oh, I'll finish. It just um, will. You're just breaking up a little, I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess the one thing I'll say about Erie, I don't know much about the monitoring groups there, but it is microcystis that's the culprit there also. That much we certainly know. Hmm. Can I ask a question? I have a, a question of Nate concerning sampling. Uh, we have said we have only data for three years actually. So I understand that sampling is a, a difficult issue in terms of um, uh, sequencing. But Nate, I wonder whether you you thought about um, sampling only the um, sites that were in the um, in the uh, basket, so to speak, every three years, all three years. In other words, so that you can compare phenomena in the same spot among the same elements of the sample because your sample now varies a great deal and as you know variability is death of conclusions so uh, this might be a suggestion it shouldn't be too difficult to just sort them out um, because we have seen an increase in number of volunteers taking samples which of course throws off some possible underlying explanation for the occurrence and recurrence of, of the bloom. So that's just the suggestion to think about. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a, a wonderful suggestion and uh, we'll certainly take a look at the data in that way. Um, I agree that, you know, holding as many of those variables, including monitoring effort, you know, constant as possible could really help us analyze the data. Um, of course, it's, you know, it's hard because the you know, the purposes of the program are twofold. And one of the primary purposes that we've always been focused on is primarily to alert people around Cayuga Lake and pe keep sure. people safe. So we always wanna increase our shoreline coverage. But yeah, I think for those zones that have held constant over the past three years, I think that that would be a great way to look at the data. Yeah, thank you. A few points, I'm Michelle Henry, um, just the Lake Erie reference, I, we actually have a very local knowledgeable source that is that had been working on Lake Erie and Jim McKenna at Tunison. So I'm not sure if um, the rest of the folks are, are familiar with that, but back when in the early 2000s to 2006 or so, there was a, um, an aquatic gap that was targeted to the fish site of species for that project. Um, so there's there's a local knowledge source there, not too far away, just in Cortland. Um, another question that I had posed earlier in the chat was, do we have sort of a sister lake that doesn't necessarily have to be Seneca because I know it's got a different parameters, but do we have a lake that we can compare ourselves to, to understand um, how our story goes um, and, and evolves through time and whether or not it's seeing similar results. I know that um, the hub was select lakes so that we could, that the story could be compared um, and could be understood in its finer details. So I'm just curious where we're at with that. Yeah, well, we haven't done monitoring for blooms on other lakes in the Finger Lakes or you know, taking an in-depth look that, at their data. Um, I might pass this one over to Ruth, if that's okay. I know you didn't get to present on your Canandaigua Lake results, but I know that you have been working with Canandaigua Lake this year, so that might be interesting to hear about. Yeah, and if any of them are still on or on, they can correct me, but um, my sense is, I mean, uh, so Canandaigua, um, tends to have a little later season, right? I mean, some of these problems though are like, they are a little smaller, they're a little, you know, there's there's microclimate differences potentially. Um, I think they had a pretty typical season, maybe a little bit, a little bit more blooms this year. Um, Seneca, they did point out that Seneca for whatever reason didn't have as many blooms as it has, you know, because in terms of like lake size and, you know, our best sister lake is Seneca. 
but I don't know that anybody understands why Seneca didn't have the season it had last year or the year before that on Seneca yet. Um, yeah, no, I was just curious because we aren't like Seneca in the sense that Seneca doesn't have the same um, north south shelf that we have that we have a different um, angle in the north south um, fetch flow it than they do um, so and then the the location with um, soils and ag inputs and nutrient flows and all of that it, it it's a tricky thing to find a sister to find a comparable so I'm just, I, I'd go worldwide. I'm just kind of curious if, as the story progresses, where, um, if there is an, let's see what they're doing. And if we can join ranks and learn and figure this out, let's do it. Cool. Yeah, just just a, a, a comment. I, I don't think uh, that DEC is paying for microsystem analysis anymore. Oh. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Nate, Hillary, but uh, and and Ruth, but I think they stopped paying for that uh, last year, actually. So I think it's been two years where they have been relying on volunteer um, identification of HABs, uh, which, based on DEC data, is incredibly accurate. <laughs> Volunteers are right about what 99 point something percent of the time. So it's a very good system for identifying harmful algal blooms. But uh, I, I don't believe that they're still uh, testing for microcystin or for, uh, or for chlorophyll. Um, and so that, I mean, and that, that makes it difficult to compare, you know, lake to lake if you don't have, if you don't have those data. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so uh, I, I wish uh, I wish the DEC would resume its funding <laughs> of, uh, of microcystin analysis. That would be great, uh, but apparently that's not a priority at this time. Could could I? Um... I have some more questions, basically, um, and maybe suggestions. Is that uh, you know some people have criticized our sampling um, methods because we always look for the most dense portion of the bloom that we're observing, and uh, so we're getting point data, and it may not be representative of the extent of the bloom, um, and also. Uh, it's been pointed out that maybe we should be measuring other things. And uh, I know that's a big demand perhaps on, uh, on our uh, harriers, but uh, we do make weather observations and so forth uh, to put those in, but those are all uh, qualitative rather than quantitative. But, you know, for example, might it not help if we, could somehow measure the phosphorus uh, concentration uh, in the samples that we're taking in order to see how we're trying to correlate with nutrients. And, you know, one would hope, Ruth, that um, there might be progress in quick sampling, quick and simple sampling of, uh, of nutrients, for example. So, uh, you know, it'd be great to have an instantaneous gauge that is simultaneously measuring things like temperature and phosphorus content and so forth. Um, but that's a pipe dream, perhaps. Um, anyway, it's just that, um, you know, to go beyond the observational things that we try to alert Lake residents about occurrences and to go more into the scientific realm, I think, is, is uh, something that uh, many of us are interested in. And I know it's a huge challenge because it's already a very complicated logistical thing to get samples down to the lab and so forth. Um, and, uh, but uh, I, it, it, I just wondered what, um, Steve and 
Nate and Ruth might have in terms of comments about my statement. <laughs> well, well I, I, I do know my microscope can't see phosphorus. It can't see phosphorus. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect that, right? <laughs> um, Sorry. But is somebody, isn't somebody trying to do a quick test for those kind of nutrients? And oh, oh okay. So, so John, it's, 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 it's really complicated, okay? Because if you when you collect a bloom, you have uh, the ambient water and you have the, um, the cyanobacteria. Okay, so how are you going to accurately measure the concentration of phosphorus in the ambient water? You, you have to filter the sample, okay, and and uh, and uh, to get rid of the cyanobacteria on the have them retained on the filter, and then measure phosphorus in the filtrate. The problem with that is that you don't know how many of those cyanobacteria might have, uh, you know, died, gone belly up, and uh, released their phosphorus into the filtrate. Okay, so. I mean, yes, you could separate them, and yes, you could measure the phosphorus. Um, I'm not sure how confident you could be that the phosphorus uh, concentration you were measuring in the filtrate was an accurate reflection of the ambient uh, water concentration before the bloom occurred, okay? Um, now, uh, you'd have to do a bunch of controls, okay? Uh, to, to try to make sure that you were getting the actual phosphorus concentration. Um, so it's really, uh, you know, so, so, I mean, we've thought about that, we've talked about that, we, we could do the measurements, but it's, uh, but the problem is that I, I'm not sure we could be confident that we were measuring what we hoped we were measuring in terms of the phosphorus concentration in the bloom. I, I think the more, the more, uh, I, I, I think it's, it's easier, of course, to measure the phosphorus concentration before the bloom occurs. Um, you know, so one approach might be to just um, to uh, track uh, phosphorus in uh, uh, locations where blooms are occurring on a regular basis. Um, and uh, like the more focused uh, uh, zonal approach that has other people have discussed today. And, uh, you know, and maybe track phosphorus in one of the locations where we now know there's a high likelihood of blooms occurring. And maybe as a control, tracking phosphorus in, a in, in an area where we know the uh, occurrence of, of uh, blooms is unlikely. Uh, so, so I think that, that might be a more, a more uh, you know, I, you'd have more confidence, I think, in those results, even though they wouldn't tell you exactly what you wanted to know. Uh, but they might, you might have more confidence in that. Yeah, that, that would seem to argue for um, choosing some fixed sites where blooms have occurred and to do more longitudinal testing of all kinds of water quality at those, uh, say, periodically, rather than just when a bloom is occurring. Yeah. yeah. Right, and then that becomes a funding issue too. Okay, just to just to clear because it's not it's not cheap. Okay, to, to do I that. Mean, you know, part of my question comes. I've heard, and maybe it's rumor, that the military has been working on remote sensing of phosphorus uh, because of its content in explosives. Uh, and uh, using remote sensing, uh, you know, there's the question as to whether uh, that could be extend extended to civilian applications. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, obviously that's expensive, but uh, might be expensive. Um, but, uh, and, and maybe all of that work is classified, I don't know. <laughs> But, uh, you know, the use of drones or, or even in direct sampling, um, whether there are some technologies lurking out there that we haven't learned about. That's, uh, yeah, just, so just a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, comments on that. I mean, one is that uh, it's important to remember that, that uh, fossil are not a predictor necessarily of blooms, okay? 
like a, a couple of years ago, Skinny Atlas was experiencing quite a few blooms and their phosphorus concentrations uh, are, I, I believe are significantly lower than Cayuga Lake. Um, and uh, uh, so, so that's one idea. The other, the other thing is that uh, I, I'd be very curious how, how low uh, the military is able at, at the, con the concentrations that the military is able to detect phosphorus. Um, I could imagine that they might be able to maybe at hundreds or thousands of milligrams per liter, which is what you might expect of, of uh, ordnance uh, uh, containing phosphorus. But uh, at the levels that we're concerned with, 10 to 20 micrograms per liter, I'd be really surprised if, if even a drone <laughs> by, uh, from the United States military could detect that, because those are really low concentrations. It's hard enough to do it in a lab, let alone you know, from, uh, from the air. Well, and they're probably not detecting it in water either. They're probably looking at it on, on land for um, traces of them. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's just part of my fantasy, I guess. <laughs> John, your question brings me to, to um, ponder about Lou McCaffrey's work that's been being done. I don't know where he is. I haven't heard a um, post study since... Um, since the last couple of years. So I'm just curious if any of that would overlap. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work, but he's doing um, remote sensing, watching satellites and, and weather patterns as well over the sites as the HABs are happening. Yeah, I, I, just to quickly comment on that, I think that's a, an interesting initiative um, by the DEC to look at satellite images and, and try and use those to detect harmful algal blooms. Um, the, just the few kind of hurdles with that is that, you know, satellites only go over the lake, you know, on certain intervals, um, and that isn't necessarily when blooms are going to be. Um, so there's just some things to work out with that, but I think very interesting to look at the, the lake from a bird's eye view there. Yeah, bird's eye view minus any clouds or anything else too. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, actually just last night I contemplated adding a little video of the, the Landsat. So NOAA has Landsat uh, imagery and yeah, it doesn't happen every day, but we did get just so you know, there are some days for, that were uh, hot spots, like the those September days. There are clear views of the lake. I just haven't had a chance to sort of go in and see um, if there's any valuable info in there. But we did actually get lucky on some of the bad days this year. There are satellite imagery um, without cloud cover. Wow. You know, and the other thing with the with the phosphorus, just some of this is echoing. You know, with with something that's such a limiting nutrient right? The, there's a weird relationship with the concentration, right? It's like, it, it's actually the fact that it's going to be very low concentration that says, oh yeah, that was the limiting nutrient. They're sucking it all up. So as Steve said, you know, it, it would be more informative before potentially, but even then, you know, and maybe the most important thing is to have a handle on the inputs of phosphorus to the lake, right? So with some of the creek programs and monitoring programs that CSI has been doing. Um, and then one other sort of big question mark is in, in lake cycling with the sediments or the hypolimnia in the lower levels and like reseeding phosphorus from within the lake might be a, kind of a missing piece there. So those are, there. it's interesting, it's just such an un, it, it's a, a non-linear <laughs> kind of system. So the question then remains, how do we all collaborate and go after some major cash to get a lot of things done since Cayuga Lake hasn't been, been waiting on the TMDL to get in action. Well, funding is always a question. And, uh, you know, I think we have to keep making a point that the uh, Cayuga Lake uh, Watershed Network is uh, uh, part of the Great Lakes Watershed Network. And uh, maybe that's a better way of attracting national funding from other agencies and so forth and um but uh mm. you know but the, the other point i'd make about nutrients is 
I remember a paper that Bob Howarth presented a couple of years ago where he was talking about whether nitrogen might be another significant nutrient for uh, um, perhaps. And, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's... Um, yeah, but know, we, I, we I will throw one... The, the more dimensions we have, the more complex yes. it gets, right? right? <laughs> I will, I will throw in with respect to the nitrogen piece, some of these uh, cyanobacteria, like the Dolphospermum, can fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere, a number of the species, not microcystis. So there is an interesting progression potentially there where that nitrogen limit is satisfied by one species, but potentially that nitrogen keeps on getting sort of funneled around, um, which, which again then brings me back to phosphorus. I know Bob's always talking about nitrogen, but like I think phosphorus is, is a big piece. No one can fix phosphorus out of the atmosphere, as far as I know. So uh, nitrogen, there are some organisms that can, can alleviate that pressure, um, maybe to the benefit of the whole phytoplankton community. Um, and the other piece of money, I don't know if this is even going to occur. What about the, the, the HABS action plan, right? As, as little as they were going to spend on monitoring, they were going, they were proposing to spend a lot of millions on best management practices and mitigation of nutrients. I wonder if anybody has an update on whether the state is still gonna come through with that 65 million. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that that money was um, somewhat, uh, uh, I'm sorry. I think it got, got used and appropriated um, already a long time ago. Uh, but one piece that we're missing here that you learn if you take part in um, some of the other HABs conversations, um, especially the Tonkas County level committee convened by Darby Kiley and others, uh, is uh, you get a little hint of all the great stuff that the Soil and Water Conservation District offices are doing with um, landowners to try to uh, reduce runoff. And these are small projects quite often. Uh, they don't cover a lot of land, um, but they are good to know about. And I think that's where some of that f famous 65 million um, has been put to very good use. And uh, it would be good to hear more from that side of our watershed community to, you know, to know what's being done. Um, we, we get um, good uh, reports, especially from Seneca County Soil and Water, um, chaired by um, uh, Erin Perizzini. And she has shared information about several of the projects going on there that are good to see. But again, they're just a tiny bit of the watershed, um, but it's a good trend and a good place to put money, I think. Well, um, do you think we might uh, want to ease off here and go have lunch, guys? I'm sorry we can't have lunch together. Um, I want to thank everybody. Looks like we've still got 20 participants hanging in there. So uh, good job, everyone. And um, again, we'll be seeing you in a few at our meeting. And thanks so much to Ruth and to Nate for fantastic uh, presentations that I think illuminated and excited a lot of people. Thank you. Thanks, Hillary, and thanks, Jen. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.